Hey, welcome to the Link Church podcast channel. You're now listening to one of our Sunday services. If you'd like to know more about Link Church, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Now lean in and be encouraged by God's word for you today. And so today, the title of my sermon is called Behold. Uh, it is to see or observe a thing or a person, especially a remarkable or impressive one. Last week, we spoke about to be loved. And last week, we spoke about how we find our identity. And isn't it true in our lives that a lot of what we base our identity is, what, is, is in what we do? We, we, as the older we get, it's all about what we do. And we build up our trophy cabinet. And we look at that and we go, look, look, look what I did. But we realize that what you do doesn't really do, uh, redefine or put purpose into your life. And then we looked about what, we, what people say about us. This is a very powerful thing. This influences li- our lives like never before. This person praised me. This person criticized me. And we did the lifeline. Do you remember the lifeline? Who wasn't here last week? Lovely. So I'll repeat it for you. So we had the lifeline like this. And so we have this lifeline that we live. God gives us one life. And I was born in 1974. And then off we go. I don't know when I'm going to die. But we have this line. And what happens is we live our lives according to what we do and what people say about us and what we have. What happens is we have this emotional roller coaster that goes up and down, up and down. One minute we feel good because someone said, oh, you're looking good. And then someone said, no, you, you did terrible. And this happened. And then suddenly you drop down again. And what happens in our lives is they go along and we find no purpose purpose and significance and we die and the influence that we thought we would have we never did but God's desire for us is not to live a life like that his desire for us is to go boo 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 into eternity he wants to put something inside you and remind you today that you are no longer a slave you're a son and you're a child of God just as he would sit over Jesus before he was baptized he said Jesus you are my son on whom my favor rests I believe in you he hadn't performed a thing yet he wants to say to you today and remind you you haven't performed it yet but I want to speak a word over your life you are my beloved with whom I'm well pleased we like the father that runs up and down the game and says, my boy, I don't care what team you play, but I'm going to put courage in you. I'm going to put my love in you, and I'm going to remind you that you are good enough. And I think so often in our lives, we live with that, that framework. It's about what we do. It's about what we have, and it's what, what people say about us. But today, I want to speak about beholding. I want to speak about, because I believe that when we behold the Father, we're going to walk like He walked. When we behold the Father, we will become like Him. When we behold the Father, we won't go around battles. We will walk through the battle. When we behold the Father, we will become brave and courageous. When we behold Him, He puts a fire inside our hearts that begins to ignite. It puts a confidence inside of us. But you see, beholding has to do with faith. You see, last week, we, 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 this was the tagline, was this. It's not that we don't love God. It's that we don't fully understand how much He loves us. And for us to fully understand how much He loves us, we need to understand what is that, that trigger? What's the key? The trigger is to have faith. It's to believe. And I want to speak about faith today. You see, faith is like a diamond. It's multifaceted. It has very many things to it. It's hard to describe, but the Bible describes faith. He says, in fact, if you believe, you will walk by faith. He says that the righteous will live by faith. Faith in the beginning and faith around you. That is what we accompany. That is what we are called to live as we people who believe in God. We have faith. It says this about faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. So we need faith. God says, when you come to me, you must believe that I'm God, and you must believe that I'm a rewarder of those who seek me. But then it also says this about faith. It says that faith is, faith is believing what you hope for, certain of what you cannot see. Faith has to do with something you cannot see. Do you know that the Bible says that what is unseen is eternal, what is seen is temporary. So this, this thing, this, what do you call this? Lectin. This lectin, you can see it. But the Holy Spirit, you cannot see. But God, you cannot see. But Jesus, you cannot see. But this lectern, it's going to wear and fade. But I want to tell you, my friends, the Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus will never wear and fade. They will go on forever. Faith is about seeing. It's about giving you a perspective. It's about seeing with eyes that God would give you. Now, the Bible is full of stories of people that God opened their eyes. Because you see, we can have many perspectives. It's like you and I, we go and watch the Sharks play, and I go with a friend of mine, and we go and watch, we come back and we, get, and we give two different reports. Isn't it funny that we go and see the same game, and yet one person says the Sharks played well, and the other one says, oh, they suck. Isn't that true? We can have different perspectives, but God says the important perspective is to see through my eyes. 
You know, Abraham, when he came out, God said, Abraham, get out of your tent so that you can stand up and look at, open your eyes and see your descendants. They are like the stars in the sky. He opened Abraham's eyes. Elijah had a servant. His name was Gehazi. How's that for a name? Gehazi. They found themselves in a valley surrounded by enemy lines. And he was starting to get fearful. His legs were trembling. And Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see. And he opened his eyes and he saw angels surrounding the, sol- the, the soldiers. It's amazing when we open our eyes. No longer do we look at our default, but we look at a God that stands on our side. We get to see. He opens our eyes. On the road to Emmaus, two people are walking. Jesus is dead, but they're walking with him. He reappears to them. They don't know who he is. He gets to his house. They break bread, and it says that their eyes were open to see. They saw Jesus. Friends, faith has to do with seeing. I remember many years ago, it was about 99, 2000, and uh, I had a friend of mine that came down from Joburg, and uh, we uh, grew up riding horses, and we played this game called Polacross. For those of you who don't know, it's like rugby on on horses. So you have this stick and this ball and you go flat out. Your horses, you, that's what you do. You ride hard. And, and so this guy came down and uh, he, 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 had, he could ride. He'd done some show jumping and stuff. But, but he now, he was like, no, I want to play this game. He's quite passionate about it. He says, no, I'd like to buy a horse. So I said, that's wonderful. So he said, well, look, we're going to go up to Shongweni. There's a polo tournament happening over there and we can go and see some horses. There's this guy. He's got six horses. We're going to go and try them out. I said, with pleasure. I remember that day. It was an overcast day, a big southwester blowing and off we went up to Shongweni. We arrived there at Shongweni, and you know what it's like? When they're in kloof, they're aloof, and the dogs go woof. You know what I'm saying? And we, we, we arrive there, we get onto the polar field, and there's, you know what it's like? It's, oh, God, jolly good show, you know? Replace the tuffets on the thing. You know, you stand on, and there we were in our jodhpurs and our jeans, like, mm, we're looking good. And we got out that day, we said, oof, I'm looking forward to this, going to ride some polar ponies. And so the, the patron, the person who owned the horses, he, didn't, he sort of steered us to a man. He said, go down the road there. You'll find a man by the name of Philemon. He'll help you with these six horses. So I looked at my friend Devin. I said, are you sure it's six? He says, it's six. It's six. So I said, okay, off we go. And we're walking down with our jods, you know. We walk, walk down the polo field. And we walk down the corner. And we see this big lorry. And then next to the lorry are six horses lined up, tacked up, ready to go. And we see some grooms standing around and we, Philemon comes across to me. And Philemon is bold. You know, he's quite a strong looking guy. He walks up to me, he says, introduces himself, very confident. He says, are these the six horses? I said, yes. He says, okay, bring the first one. And the first one came out. It was a beautiful chestnut. Had a great hind quarter, high wither, beautiful eyes. I was like, mm, this must be the one. Philemon looked at me. He just shook his head. I got on the horse like this. I started to go. It felt uncomfortable. It had a weird canter. I tried to stop it, wouldn't tug, wouldn't stop. He said, okay, dropped off. I said, this isn't the one. I jumped on the next one. And then I jumped on the third one. And the fourth one was a dappled gray. Mm, this dappled gray had looked good. Had a big chest, had a high wither. I was like, mm, Devin, this is the one. I got on the dappled gray, oh, awkward. Running around, trying to stop it. Just, I couldn't stop it. I jumped off. Philemon shook his head at me. I did the fifth one and the sixth one. All six horses got off and Devin, his shoulders were shrugging down. I was sitting down. I was like, oh my gosh. I turned around to Philemon. I said, Philemon, is there anything more? He said, no, there is one more. I want to call one more. I seize this one. I want to call this one last horse. And he turned to the grooms. He said, which means go and find that horse right down in the bottom valley. And off they went to find this horse. And this horse came and I saw it from a distance. Had a scrawny little chest. Looked awkward. Was very thin. And walked up. All I can remember is these big eyes. And he walked up to me and I'm looking at this horse. I'm thinking, oh my gosh. What has he just pulled out the bottom valley? And Philemon. This is when Philemon came alive. Philemon had a smile on him and his eyes lit up. And he said, get set. This horse's name was called Get Set. He says, put the saddle on Get Set. Saddle got onto Get Set. Now looked across at Devon. Devon's nearly crying now because he's thinking, I've driven all the way to Sean Gwenny to look at a horse like this. And as I got up like this, he put me on. Philemon held his bride like this, and he's giving Get Set a little rub like this. These big eyes, they're looking at us. I jump on. He says, hmm, Kosan, you better hold on. And I got on this horse, and I trotted out. And I went from a trot to a canter. I went from a canter. It had such a rhythm in it. It's such a great, it was like, it was like driving a Cressida down into Amkamas. It was like a, <laughs> I was driving down like, and this thing just started to build a rhythm. It started to build a rhythm. And then I started to turn it and it started to dig into the ground. I was like this, I'm telling you, it was like a cat on steroids. Have you seen a cat? And I, and I promise, and then I, and then I said, and then, and then you could see my, my chest started to swell. I was like, 
get set. And it said those beautiful eyes. He was looking, get set, was looking back at me and he's looking ahead. And then I said, I, let him, I wanna let him go. And from a canter, I dropped out into a gallop right across that polar field. And I felt the wind come alive in me like never before. And Philemon, as we did this, his eyes began to lit up and he started to go. And then I stopped, I thought, I wonder how the brakes are. And I touched on the brakes. And as I touched, it was like ABS. I was driving a Mercedes Benz in Shongweni. <laughs> I came back like this Devon by now, his chest was out. He was like, glory, I found my horse. Philemon looked at me, he says, you see, Kwasan, you see what I saw? You see, friends, Philemon gave me a picture of what God sees. You see, God wants to see, he wants you to see like he sees. He wants you to see what he sees because when we see what he sees, we will walk in, in victory. We will walk even though our circumstances are hard. We will walk in victory. We will see potential in what, who God has called us to be. Philemon, that is get set. And he saw something so powerful. God wants you to see what he says about you and your life as we behold him. But here's the thing, friends, and all of us know that in life, we can either through, look through eyes of fear or eyes of faith. Eyes of fear or eyes of faith. And there's a story in the Bible that I want to go to. It's in Numbers chapter 13. Not, pe not many people read the book of Numbers. It's in the Old Testament, but it's a story about Moses. He was on a huge relocation project. He was taking people out of the, the clutches of Pharaoh, and he was about to take them into the promised land. He had two million people with him. How's that for a leadership problem? And these people, he took them out of the clutches of Pharaoh, and he started to walk in the wilderness. And before I read the scripture, it's going to come up just now. He started to walk. It says they walked for two years. Two of the 40 years they've been walking and they started to walk and they got to a little town called Corinth, or I don't know what the name was, but they got to a town and Moses was like, okay, we've had enough walking now. It's time for us to get our inheritance because God said, I'm going to put you through the Jordan and into the promised land. And so what Moses said, I said, I'm going to select 12 spies. It's time for a reconnaissance. I'm going to choose my best men. And so he chose 12 men from the 12 trials. He suited them up with, I don't know, M16s and AK-47s, whatever was going their way, their way. He said, my boys, I want you to go into that foreign land. I want you to go and tell me what the fruit looks like. And I want you to come back with a report. And so these 12 guys went off in faith. And they crossed the Jordan and they went and they saw what was happening in the, day, in, in, in the land of the promised land. They picked some fruit, they saw the people that were living there, and they turned around and came back. And when they came back, Moses gathered all 12. He said, listen here, my friends, tell me, what was the report like? 10 of the 12 said it's a magnificent land. It is flowing with fruit and money. It's, it's great, but, but the giants live in there but they're gonna take us out, but they're gonna overwhelm us, but they're gonna, you know what they were looking through? Eyes of fear. There were two men, Joshua and Caleb, the only two men we know. I could mention some other names like Shammah and Agatha, and I don't know, no one will ever know those other 10 people. The only people we'll ever remember in the Bible is Joshua and Caleb. The two people that came said, you know what? It does look magnificent. And yes, there are tall people there. And yes, it looks like there are some giants. But I'll tell you what, God has given us this land. We need to go in and take in our inheritance. You know what they were looking through? The eyes of faith. They were like Philemon. And God wants to ask you today, in your circumstances, you find yourself, whether you're a businessman, a mum at home, a teacher, wherever you might find yourself, God wants to ask you today, are you looking through the eyes of fear? Or are you looking through the eyes of faith? And so today I wanna unpack that for you. There, there, there are five things that, that have to do with looking through fear. And uh, there are five things that happen to these people. And I want to read that scripture, if you can bring it up. I want to, give, I want to mention five areas of fear, then five areas of faith. And end with a story that I believe God's going to turn, us, turn our eyes on him. It says, but Caleb quietened the people before Moses. He said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for you are well able to overcome it. It was a good report. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they, so they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great heart. Great heart. Number one, you can write this down. Number one, fear. What happens when you see through the eyes of fear? We exaggerate our difficulties. We exaggerate our difficulties. You see, these people, they had just come out of Pharaoh, the greatest king that ever ruled and reigned, and now they were worried about some little town with some tall people. 
It's amazing what happens in our lives when we exaggerate our difficulties. It's amazing what happens in our lives when we listen to the negative report. You know what's gonna happen in your lives? The negative is always gonna be the majority. The negative in this world is always gonna be the majority. You don't have to live long enough in South Africa for you to listen to the negative report about our country and where it's going and what our children are in for, am I right? It just takes two people to stand up. God plus one is a majority. When you stand up with the voice of God inside of you and say, no, 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 I'm gonna refuse to believe a negative report. My difficulty is in tough because I have a God that is on my side. Oh, it's, it's amazing how we do that. We exaggerate it. They said, no, the people are tall. They're these massive guys. They're these giants. But you know what happened? 38 years later, when Joshua went to inhabit the promised land, he came across the Nephilim, these tall people. And the tall people said to them, you know what they said to them? We've been shaking in fear for 38 years. We heard about how you came out of Pharaoh. We heard about the God you served. We heard about what you had done, and their legs were shaking. They said, we would have given that, surrendered to you at the glimpse, at anything. If you, if you just arrived, your feet would have been on the ground. We would have surrendered. You know what this tells me, my friends? We often have, a, the, the battles in the mind, we have a devil that tries to remind us of our past, but I wanna tell you, his death is, is nigh. His time is nearly up. He's nearly come, he's coming to an end. His knees are shaking. Do you know why? Because you're a child of God and you've been called to walk into your promised land. Child of God to walk into the promised land. Number one, when we see through eyes of faith, we exaggerate our difficulties. Number two, we underestimate our own abilities. The Bible says here, Numbers 13, it says, it seemed like we were grasshoppers. Grasshoppers? How's that to do with poor self-image, poor self-esteem? Hey, what does a grasshopper do? It grovels around and it eats the grass and it hops every now and then. But my friends, I wanna tell you, God does not call you a grasshopper. He calls you a giant killer. God is, not a, God is not interested in what your low self-esteem. You know what happens? Low self-esteem soon take, erodes our lives. You know why? Because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, two minutes ago, five minutes ago, someone said something over your life that you've taken hold and have believed, and so you're still walking around like a grasshopper. Victims never walk into victory. Victims never walk into victory. If you're gonna keep thinking you're a grasshopper, you're gonna walk like a grasshopper and act like a grasshopper. But I wanna remind you today, God does not that speak that over your life. He gives you an image that is in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He says this identity is found in Christ and Christ alone. You know what happens primarily is we look at our faults. So maybe it's alcoholism or something. So primarily we say, no, I'm an alcoholic. No, 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 my friends, you are a believer in Christ. Your identity is him. And then you might battle with the problem of alcohol. You might battle with anxiety. No, no, I'm not an anxious people that has panic attacks. No, 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 I'm a, a son of God, but I might deal with this problem. But initially and primarily, my identity is in Christ. My identity is Him. And when we know Him, we become like Him. And we walk with a confidence in spite of our weakness. You know, guys, I don't know about you, but Sundays we, we stand up in your church and they feel like the guy on the platform has got it all worked out. Monday I arrive at home, and I lie on my bed and I think like, oh my gosh, what have I gone through? What has just happened? You know what it feels like sometimes? We get those vulnerable moments where the devil starts to sow those seeds. You're never good enough. You'll never make it. You aren't. You're a grasshopper. And you know what he wants to remind you and that he keeps coming at you 24 seven. You never have what it takes. You'll never be good enough. You'll never. And so this voice keeps to creep. Friends, we need to shut that voice off, get out of Egypt and start to walk into the promised land where there's a God that came for us and resurrected us and put life inside of us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Okay, so you're excited this morning. Wonderful. Number three, when we look through eyes of fear, we get discouraged, discouraged. You know what the enemy wants to do? He wants to rob your courage. He wants to take your confidence. He wants to put it aside. And you know what it says? It says all night, and there, you can go down a bit, please. It says that all night, they had a pity party. The congregation got together and they began to cry all night. You know what happens when something goes wrong and you hear a bad report? Don't you get your family around and then you get your friends around and then you talk a little bit more and then suddenly it, it turns from like discontent to crying and then you start to mourn and then you start to moan. You know what happens when we get around together in numbers? You know what happens? That's what it starts to happen. We start to get discouraged. When you look through the eyes of fear, you walk with a lack of courage and confidence. 
God's desire for us is to walk in His confidence, not our own. His confidence, not our own. He's the one who said, I'm gonna put you in the promised land. In Exodus chapter three, it says this, God will do three, four things in your life. I will save you, I will redeem you, I will deliver you, and I will fulfill you. Notice you're not gonna do it. It's a promise from Him. And when we start to believe that, when we start to have faith that sees that, we're no longer grasshoppers, we're no longer discouraged, there's a courage that starts to well up in us. Somebody give me eyes like Philemon. Point four, we start to gripe. It says that they grumbled and they started to gripe and whine. You know what, you know, moaning and whining? Anyone, anyone have that before? Anyone hear some moaning and whining? No one. Okay, wonderful. I'm the only one. No one. They started to grumble and they started to moan and they, they started to, they, they, you know what they had? They started to fall into discontent. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I don't like the church and hey, no, the pastor did that and oh, no, my friend did that and hey. discontent starts to rally up so quickly. And suddenly your perception goes out the door. Suddenly those voices overcloud the confidence that God has given you and you start to walk in defeat. Discontent. And you know what happens in the last one when we look through eyes of fear? We give up and we blame God. You know what they said to Moses? Moses, we would rather go back to Egypt. We would rather die in the wilderness. Hey Moses, let's elect a new leader and we're gonna carry on, go back. You know what God said? Because of the bad report, you and this whole generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, are gonna die in the wilderness. My friends, God doesn't want you to die in the wilderness. His desire for us is to walk by faith into the promised land. That is the goal of his life. His, life, his thing for us is not to go up and down on this thing and then we die. His life is that we would, we would find ourselves in Christ, behold the King and make a difference for eternity and through the lives of this community. And they looked and they blamed God. Oh, it's lovely when you blame others. Oh, blame my father, blame my sister, blame God. Hey, he's the last option, but hey, God, you, you did that to me, God. This is why I'm like that. And we blame and we blame and we blame. And it gets us nowhere. You know what happens? They said, look, I'd rather go back to Egypt. Do you know why? Egypt was a place of slavery and yet they felt safe there. Sometimes we go back to that which we know, that habit, that thing that we know we're in slavery, but we want to go back there because we want to go back into our comfort zone. But I want to tell you comfort and freedom on the opposite spectrums. Comfort and faith on the opposite spectrums. I want to tell you, friends, there's nothing comfortable about walking out in faith. There's nothing comfortable about leaving Egypt and stepping into the foreign land where there might be giants and taller people, but I wanna tell you, that is where the miraculous happens. That is where you see things happen like you've never seen in your life before. Anybody wanna live a curious and adventurous life? Then I challenge you, my friends, start to step out and walk in faith. Faith is seeing things, is the ability to see things not as they are, but as they could be or should be. Faith is not being able to see the things that they are. You know what R is? Your circumstances right now. What I'm going through, what this world looks like, what my neighbor said, what my friend said, what my husband's going through, what my children, what my business is doing, it's, that's what they are. But faith is choosing to look and say, look what it says in God's perspective. I'm believing a breakthrough over my business. I'm believing healing over my child. I'm believing the best is yet to come. I believe that my best years lie ahead. That's what faith is. But the people said, no, we wanna go back to Egypt. Faith is about taking risks. Now I wanna mention six things that are gonna help us move from a place of fear into faith. What happens when we see with God's perspective? Point number one here, faith shrinks my problems. We get a new perspective. You see, when we have a big God, our problems become small. If you have a small God, your problems become big. Isn't that right? When you have a small God, suddenly that problem overemphasizes itself. You see, the Bible says in Genesis, God says this, is my arm too short to save? Is there anything too hard for me to do? There's nothing too hard for him to do. When we have faith, our problems become null and void. They start to diminish. The Bible says in Luke 1 verse 37, for all things, nothing, sorry, for nothing is impossible with God. We need to go home to our dictionaries if you do have one at home, I don't know, and you need to delete the word impossible because nothing is impossible with God. Faith shrinks our problems. The second one is faith opens the door for a miracle. 
If you study history over the past history of the church and people that have believed in God and you've seen the greatest moves of God, how have they happened? When men have stood up and stepped out in faith. The miraculous happens. God says this in Mark. He says, he said this, he said, Mark faith. He says, if you have faith in God, you can say to that mountain, get up into the sea. You can say to the mountain, move. You know, in God's hierarchical law of faith, faith is above the law of nature. That's why Jesus looked at the storm and he said, quieten down. That's why he turned water into wine. That'll help someone here today. That's why he took the bread and he broke it and he fed the 5,000. Jesus had the ability to stand up over nature and so do you. And so do you. Every time we walk in faith, we, can, we walk above the level of nature. I remember many years ago farming and we had a crop, 2,000. I remember like it was yesterday. And we decided to give the farm to Jesus. We began to pray. We said, Lord, we're expecting you to do much on our behalf. And that year we got 30 to 40% more. We looked at fertilizer. We looked at rainfall. It was all the same. But you know what God did? He superseded the act of nature. And he gave us a crop we never thought possible. And I want to tell you, my friends, if he can do it then, he can do it again. He can do it again in your life. He supersedes nature. God opens the door for miracles. Three, faith moves God to act on my behalf. Number three, faith moves God to act on my behalf. Friends, we are not of the association of name it and claim it. Or God is like a genie where you rub him and you say, God, make it happen. That's not what God is. God is God and he's in control. But I want to tell you, friends, William Carey said this, if we expect great things from God, if we attempt great things from God, we can expect great things from God. We say in this church often, our expectation is God's invitation to move. When we become expectant for Him, you see, when I expect a little, what are you going to do? I'm going to receive a little. But if I expect much for Him, I can expect Him to move on my behalf. How is your expectation? Are you expecting for God to move in your life? Are you expecting to see his miracles? God says, I will move on your behalf. Faith allows it not to see things as they are, but as they could be. Point number four, faith unlocks the promises of God. There are 7,000 promises in the word of God. And the Bible says they are yes and amen in Christ. Every single one of them. They're almost blank checks waiting to be signed saying, will you trust me for this? Will you trust me that I will help you? Will you trust me that you are my son and daughter? Will you trust me with my, your protection and my blessing? Unlock it. When we have faith, it unlocks it. And when it unlocks it, God does things in our lives that we never thought possible. I said last week, it's like running in the matrix. You just go, and you see things happen around in your life that you can never talk about or never comprehend. And you see things happen. You go like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? You know how? Because faith unlocks it. It's like riding get set. Mm, Cressida, 2.8 down into the trans car. You're like, ooh, you feel it around you because God does something so miraculous to you. And you know what? It stirs you and builds your faith. How good is God? He unlocks the promises of God. Faith gives us the ability to walk at our dreams. That's five. To walk in our dreams. You know, the Bible is full of dreamers. Abraham dreamed. Daniel dreamed of a kingdom to come. Nehemiah dreamed of the wars being built. Paul dreamed of a church in Europe that would impact the world, and it did. Peter dreamed of a church that would reach the Jews and the Gentiles. John, Jesus' closest disciple, was on the Isle of Patmos, and he dreamed of the future. The, the, the Bible is full of dreamers. Friends, God invites you to start dreaming. Dream about your future. Write it down. Start to walk in it. Start to ask God, God, give me dreams. I dream. If we're going to say the best is yet to come, God, help me. We don't need information, God. We need your revelation. Speak to us, Father. We want to, and he wants to. They are yes. All those promises are yes and amen. In who? In Christ. It's not, that, it's not good enough just to know about him. It's to know him personally. And the last one, point number six, is that faith, helps us get us through the tough times. You know, if I went and planted a macadamia tree today and I put the tree in the ground, it would take me seven years to see the first nut. If I took a grapefruit and I planted it in the ground, it would take me two years for that fruit to mature. We live in a society where we want to do something today and we want to see a result tomorrow. 
Faith is about a journey. Faith is about standing strong. Faith is about resilience. Is it is one thing we can teach our children and ourselves is to stand strong and be resilient. Faith is about building character. God is more interested in your development than He is in your deliverance. God is more interested in your character. And that's what faith does. Faith keeps you strong in those tough times. Because I wanna tell you, my friends, and like it is true as I'm standing here today, tough times are gonna come your way. But it's often the people that stand strong in those tough times when the storms come. And you know what the Bible says in John 14? He is the vine and we are the branches. What does He do? He prunes us a bit. He just checks us back a bit. And that's what faith enables us to keep strong when the tough times come through the promise of God. Fear and faith. Fear and faith. It's the things that rally through our minds every day. Just this last week, and I, I, I read about it in a, in a, I didn't read about it, I heard about the story. And it was a man by the name of Rembrandt. And uh, Rembrandt was a, a painter. He was an artist. And he lived in 1606. And he painted a picture I painted a painting when in the last year of his life. Rembrandt lived a life, he believed in God, but he experienced many tragedies. He had a wife and three children. He lost his wife and he lost all three children. It was the last year of his life and he began to paint this painting of the prodigal sons. And he, as he began to paint the painting, he was reminded of Luke 15 where the father had the two sons and how much the father loved them. And this picture is right up here. That's what, that right today is in the St. Petersburg in Moscow today in, in Russia. It's there today in the museum. But many years ago, there was a man by the name of Henry Nowens, and uh, my, you might know him here today, but he was a man who was a Catholic priest. And he grew up in a home where his father deserted him, where his parents didn't love him, where he was left on his own. He became this priest. He thought, I'm gonna give my life to God. I'm gonna obey God to, to just follow him. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a moral conformist. I just wanna get, do things to, to, to achieve a purpose in my life. I don't have any significance. And it, it by happened that he went and he walked through this museum and he went and stood in front of this painting. And it says that he stood in front of this painting for two days and he wept and he wept. And people would walk past him and say, what are you looking at? And he'd look and turn to them and say, have you gotten the picture yet? Have you gotten the picture? Do you see what's going on there? And the people would stand and look. And I wanna ask you today, friends, you see that what I spoke about today is faith to see. Faith to see. That day, that man had faith to see a father. He had faith to see a father that loved him and cared for him and spoke good words over him. And the story of the prodigal son, it's written as the prodigal son, but it was never about the sons, it was about the father. When the Bible was written, it wasn't written, it was, it was, it, it was edited by man in the 1200s, uh, 1200s. But God's wanting to say today, friends, I want you to look at this picture. And this picture here is a father and a son and two sons. The first son is seated here below. He's in rags. And he's been, he was the son who said to his dad, Dad, I want to take my inheritance and I want to go and squander it. I want to go and live my life as I pleased. And as a young boy, he took his inheritance and he went away. And we know the story. He squandered everything. He found himself in a vulnerable space. So often in our lives, when we find ourselves vulnerable, that's the place where God wants to speak to us. Thank you for listening to the message today. If you felt inspired or you've got a testimony to share, why don't you email us at info at linkchurch.com. Or if you'd like to sow into this ministry financially, you can do so by going on to linkchurch.com forward slash giving. Have a blessed week.